Welcome everyone to our 50th anniversary webinar series. I'm Meg Metter, Director of Clinical Integration and Education here at NAC, and I'm also pleased to be your host and moderator for today. We are grateful to all of you for joining us and to our nationally renowned speakers for lending their voices to our discussion honoring the service of America's veterans. This webinar is especially close to my heart as I'm a veteran of the U.S. Army's Medical Service Corps and my husband is currently serving on active duty stationed at Walter Reed National Military Medical Center. To kick us off, it is my pleasure to introduce a fellow veteran, NAC's President and CEO, Tom Van Coverden, with welcoming remarks. Tom? Dr. Um, Matthews, uh, what the incredible uh, career you've had uh, with health centers, uh, certainly in Chicago and the Chicago area. Um, uh, I think you know um, Henry uh, Taylor pretty well, um, but we go back a long, long way with Miles Square. Uh, so uh, thank you for all you've done. You've practiced in the health centers. You know the health centers. We're just so very proud uh, that you're here with us, and we want to be by your side to do whatever it is that we can uh, to provide uh, care and services more effectively to more and more veterans. Uh, so to let me uh, just say that and hats off uh, to everybody, including our health centers who are gonna have some good examples of what we are doing uh, and really use this as an example for other centers who would like to follow suit. Um, I got Mr. Bohr here next to me who says hi, and I think you know him and have uh, have worked with him uh, in the past. Yeah, I did my service during the Vietnam uh, era. Um, uh, Kathy who works with me here for two sons. Um, uh, Kathy uh, uh, in our clinical affairs, or her son, I don't know, many, many of our staff just know firsthand how important the work of the VA is and what it means to, to people, especially those that for whatever set of reasons can't, aren't able to get the care uh, they need or get it right away. Um, and uh, including the behavioral health, the COVID shots, uh, yeah, the whole ball of wax. And so we wanna do even more going forward. So again, let me not take more of your time other than to say, um, uh, make to all of you and the team that we are deeply, I am deeply committed. Our board of directors is deeply committed. Uh, Mr. Bohr and our staff are, re are deeply committed and just let us know what we can do to, to be of even more help going forward. Thank you for all you do. Thank you, Tom. And I now have the pleasure of introducing Gina Capra, Senior Vice President for Training and Technical Assistance at NAC and a former Director of the Veterans Health Administration's Office of Rural Health. Gina, let me turn it over to you. Thank you, Meg. In my role at NAC, I have the honor of being one of the organization's liaisons with the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs. And I serve as a resource for understanding and pursuing Veterans Service Delivery Programs and Health Centers. It's a pleasure to be a part of today's webinar celebrating health centers' longstanding service to veterans. NAC has several resources to assist you in serving veterans. I'm pleased to spend a few minutes today highlighting those resources. You can find many of these on our NAC Veterans webpage or on the Health Center Resource Clearinghouse at www.healthcenterinfo.org. Today's webinar celebrates the military veterans who are our health center patients, employees, and volunteers. It is critical to acknowledge that veterans are part of our community and to understand how their veteran status impacts health and well being. The most recent UDS report from HRSA shows that nationally, health centers serve close to 400,000 patients who identify as veterans. This is a rate that has steadily increased over the last five years. There are approximately 18 million veterans in the United States, which is 5% of the population. The veteran demographic increasingly reflects our country's diversity and our health center population in terms of age, sex, race, ethnicity, and other demographic factors. Due to the nature of military service, veterans may have unique medical, behavioral, and social service needs. As such, caring for our veteran patients starts with assessing their needs. 
The first step is to determine the number of veteran patients at your health center. This is a required reporting field in the annual HRSA UDS submission, Table 4, Patient Characteristics. VA studies reveal that how a veteran screening question is asked matters. VA recommends a simple wording of, have you ever served? Learn more about why the way you ask the question matters and how you can ensure consistent screening through your EHR or practice management system. Caring for our veteran patients may require special effort in connecting the patchwork of services and benefits available to veterans. It is important to be aware that not all veterans are eligible for all services provided by the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, but your veteran patients and families may be eligible for programs hosted by your state county or philanthropic organizations who stand at the ready to assist with employment, supplemental income, education and training, vocational rehabilitation, or other needs. NAC has some ideas to get you started or to enhance what you may already be doing in support of your veteran patients. First, consider local philanthropic partners. Next, Take a quick read through NAC's inspiring compilation of 10 health center stories on how they are serving veterans. Here at NAC, we stay in regular communication with the Department of Veterans Affairs, known as VA, and encourage you to work with the VA when and if you can. If you're looking for a VA connection, please give us a call. Most importantly, please join the VA Community Care Network. This program, formerly known as the Veterans Choice Program, refers VA patients to local community-based providers for services not accessible by the VA due to distance, drive time, or appointment wait time. As of May 2021, over 540 health centers are officially participating as provider sites in VA's Community Care Network. Learn more through our Community Care Program Toolkit for Health Centers and our fact sheet entitled, Partnering with the VA. Finally, engage on veterans' issues nationally through NAC. You are invited to, one, stay updated on relevant policy, program, and partnering opportunities, which are posted on NAC's Supporting Veterans webpage. Two, check out the Health Center Resource Clearinghouse and search veterans at www.healthcenterinfo.org. And three, join the NAC Veterans Interest Group, which is an informal networking and information group which shares promising practices, policy updates, and operational information regarding services for the veteran populations served in community health centers. Email us at trainings at NAC.org if you're interested. In closing, NAC expresses our appreciation to you. To those who are military veterans, thank you for your service. To those who are military family members and caregivers, thank you for your sacrifice. To those who are listening today, thank you for your support of Veterans Healthcare Access. Back to you, Meg. I am honored to introduce our first guest, Dr. Cameron Matthews. Dr. Matthews is Assistant Undersecretary of Health for Clinical Services and Chief Medical Officer of the Veterans Health Administration. Dr. Matthews is a board certified family physician, advocate, and policymaker with a career focused on underserved patient populations. She joined the VA in 2016 after multiple leadership roles in Chicago in correctional medicine, federally qualified health centers, and managed care. Thank you for being here today, Dr. Matthews. Thank you so much, Meg. How's my sound? Are we doing okay? Always gotta check in in this world, right? <laughs> Great. Um, <laughs> Thank you all for having me. I feel like I've come home. I, I absolutely uh, really enjoy talking with my health center family at all times and 
and the the Gina my recording and Dick I see you on camera it's just really good friends hi um, just ecstatic to be having this conversation always ecstatic that NAC is willing to to really prioritize prioritize uh, the veteran experience and and veteran care and its programming and I think today's conversation is really going to lend itself to hopefully helping other health centers do the same because I think I think we all agree that's that's the goal. Um, there is clearly, I mean, I can I can share probably endless examples of of the a long history of the partnership between VHA and health centers, uh, whether that be locally or or at the national level. And and honestly, you should all know this partnership continues to fall in line with our secretary's goals. Uh, just as community health centers play a very critical role in in public health broadly, as we saw definitely during the pandemic. They also play such an integral role in how VHA is actually able to make sure that veterans have access to timely and high quality care. We can't do it without you, nor should we, to be honest. Um, we at VA recognize that while the healthcare landscape is, is ever changing, and my goodness, the last 18 months, uh, you can only uh, uh, smile a little bit about how much it has changed, right? Um, our unique partnership uh, and, and through that partnership, the unique population that we have, the broad geographic demands that we have really do require uh, that we need to continue to promote uh, the unique nature and, and support uh, the unique outcomes of our partnership, I would say. Um, we try to strive for partnerships across the board. Um, I, I uh, want to recognize as, as well, too, it's, it's worth pointing out that, that we even go so far as really partnering uh, with a lot of our urban Indian health programs, some of which are our health centers as well, too. Uh, we reimburse for care and we're looking for other ways to partner uh, beyond just our reimbursement agreement program. These are equally as critical as we even look at then populations of veterans and how we're serving uh, their needs jointly together. And uh, so right now we are, are proud to say that we have over 2000 community health center location sites in our community care network contract. That is beautiful. We need to continue to grow that. Uh, we need to further recognize the importance that community health centers serve in their locations, in their communities. Healthcare is local and there's, there's no other way to do this. Um, Tom pointed it out a little bit and 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 uh, Meg introduced a little bit. I, I come from the health center world. I'm very proud. Uh, I, I don't think I don't know, honestly, if, if you guys recognize I didn't recognize when I came through training. I actually did my residency training in a community health center at Miles Square. Um, and of course, prior to teaching health centers, I didn't know it at the time. But all I know is I loved every bit of medicine that I learned and that I, I wanted to, to continue to be a, a part of that. I then went on to Erie Family Health Center. I don't know if I have any of my Erie colleagues on in Chicago and, and Dr. Lee Francis, I still consider a friend and mentor. Um, I absolutely loved my experience there at the Division Street Center where I was the site medical director. And then for some reason, Mr. Taylor pulled me back to, to Miles Square. And for some reason, I mean, actually believed in me enough, pulled me back as, as chief medical officer back at Miles Square. And I think not only the growth in our new facility, but the partnership with the University of Illinois, the work that we did uh, back when Illinois was, was still trying the uh, managed Medicaid work. And that's how I kind of got into that managed care uh, space. Um, I, it really was such a unique relationship still is that it really emphasizes that these are more than just affiliations, that community health centers are, are really the, the bread and butter of so much of the work at that level where we're really helping marginalized communities um, on the south and west sides of Chicago Mile Square is still a force to be reckoned with. And I'm, I'm proud to still have friends there and it's continuing uh, to be quite a large success. But then to emphasize again, the educational piece, right? I did my residency there. I precepted residents there. And the fact that I had students coming through regularly and really understanding, you know, that over there, your medical school over there, this is real medicine. This is where we're actually affecting patients. This is where you need to work in the future. And I love that so many of my mentees have actually continued on in that path. Um, so, I'm bragging, but at the same time, I, I think you guys recognize, you know, once you're kind of in the family, you don't want to leave, right? And I'm sorry I left a little bit to join the VA, but I, I still consider myself a, a big part of that. And, and I think, again, today's conversation will continue to emphasize that overlap. 
Um, I want to talk a little bit about what we're doing in VA. Um, Gina's video there uh, emphasized that, that that Pentagon of what community care is. When I came into VA, I, I came to the community care office where I was really trying to work on provider relations. I was really trying to make that connection between what VA is at a national level, but assist our local facilities in connecting with each of your health centers. Um, VA, VHA, we have advanced considerably since I came in in 2016 because we've now implemented the Mission Act of 2018 that Gina kind of referred to. And we've even more so implemented our community care networks that have replaced uh, the choice program and their associated contracts. Um, trust me, we recognized <laughs> on a daily basis a lot of the difficulties and limitations under the choice program. And, and that's why we really uh, jumped, leaped ahead and, and made those commitments to really being a better partner to all of you, to paying our bills on time. We know that was horrendous, um, but we're, we're at a better place now where, more importantly, um, we, can, we can stand by your side and taking care of, of the veterans that are coming in your door. And we really continue to strive to simplify how we act, both as a provider, because, of course, we're providing them care as well, too, but as a also as a, a partner with you standing by your side as you as you care for those veterans as a payer. Um, it's a difficult space to be in. Many of you are probably involved with the you know ACOs in, in different ways. And so for us to have both of those roles, um, I think we're doing better in kind of traversing our responsibilities in, in both spaces, but we welcome the continued feedback as, as we uh, look even to the next generation of contracts beyond the community care network. We know we're not done yet. There is plenty of room for improvement, uh, and we thank you for your feedback. VA is proud to stand as the integrator of care, regardless of where veterans receive care, whether in your health centers, in your affiliated hospitals, we still need to be tracking the care that they're providing. We need to be integrating and offering them that really connection of the dots and, and, and being that, that larger integrator where uh, we are making sure that the veteran stays at the center and all of us together in a supportive way are, are meeting their needs. Um, whether it be through different peer support programs that I know some of our health centers have, whether it be through expanded mental health, oral health, we have those new pilots uh, going in, in New York, um, we're, we are ecstatic that we can continue to really target our efforts and that you and, and different health centers around the country are, are continuing to meet those needs. It's not just about that general care, but it's about understanding each and every veteran and, and what their needs are and how you're able to, to even look to the veterans themselves. We'll talk about that today. Look to the veterans themselves in figuring out what that program support may be. And again, it may differ from from town to town, from city to city. Um, but I think the important part is, is we all recognize that it's uh, the veterans at the lead that will help us answer those questions and, and solve their issues. Um, but most importantly, we've needed your partnership, oh my goodness, over the past 18 months, right? I think uh, we all are um, continuing to breathe through this, uh, continuing to figure out our own uh, need to, to and concerns of our own personal burnout and, and family issues and everything. But my goodness, think about the patients that we serve, right? And how they are um, equally faced uh, with a lot of concerns. And I think we as a nation have come together. I, I could not really be more proud of how we've worked together. Um, but most importantly, of course, uh, to be able to take care of veterans to the point that um, we've maintained unbelievable outcomes. VA has been very proud, uh, in fact, promoting like crazy, uh, really, uh, our decreased mortality rates as compared to uh, the private sector when you're thinking about inpatient COVID admissions and the like. Um, and, and even broader than that, our approaches to health equity when it comes to actual treatment and, again, our mortality when it comes to vaccination rates, uh, regardless of, of color or creed of our veterans, we have actually achieved outcomes that I, I think the, the rest of our U.S. health system should be questioning why can't they do the same. And that's because we have that mission, we have that focus um, for our veterans, and, and you guys are a large part of that because they, they come through your health centers in order to connect with the VA in a lot of times. And again, we appreciate your partnership. So overall, I'll, I'll brag that we've maintained even through COVID an unbelievable trust score. All of us kind of measure our different kind of 
trust in, in healthcare. And, and we're proud to brag that we're above 90% of a trust score of veterans actually utilizing our systems. We've vaccinated a single dose more than 3 million uh, veterans, uh, more than 2.5 fully vaccinated. So we still got a couple, uh, some work to do there to get them in for those second doses. Um, but we've been really proud with our outcomes. And again, um, it would not be possible without so many of you by our side in, in doing this work um, as difficult it, as it has been. Um, but the silver lining is that we're uh, starting to come out on the other end of it. And we've learned a lot. We've learned a lot about telehealth. We've learned a lot about coordination of care, right? And, and I think together we'll continue to figure that out. So how are we gonna continue to help each other? I think that's what we'll discuss today. How are we gonna do this in our health centers, in our communities? And how are we going to continue to keep veterans at the forefront to make sure they have access to the services they've they've earned? Uh, so thank you all for allowing me to to just open up and and be part of the conversation. And I really look forward to to hearing what our amazing three health centers on the panel today have been doing. Thank you so much, Dr. Matthews. I'm almost emotional here listening to your remarks. Very inspiring, and you set us up so well for today's panel discussion. So thank you. Um, I'm excited now to introduce the other incredible panelists we have for today's fireside chat. First, we welcome Rhonda D. Hoff, Chief Executive Officer at Yakima Neighborhood Health Services in Washington State. Next, we have Shauna Herman, Program Director and Certified Physician Assistant at Stedman Wade Health Services, Inc. in North Carolina. And lastly, but certainly not least, we have Rodney Hummer, Vice President of Strategy at Missouri Primary Care Association. Thank you all for being here today. So let's jump right in. I'm gonna start with you, Shauna. We know that our veteran community has become more diverse over the uh, last several years, seeing more people of color, women, younger veterans seeking care. With these changing demographics, how do you identify your veteran population within your organization? Do you have any tips on, for example, screening or evidence-based screening questionnaires? Yes, good afternoon, Meg. Thank you so much for having me here today. And thank you to the, the entire team for inviting me to speak on such an important topic. I'm happy to be here. So here at Stedman Wade Health Services, we do have um, an 11% veteran population. And just as you have stated, that population demographic is changing a bit. So about 40% of our veterans are age 55 or younger. 42% of them are of a minority race, 25% of them are women. And interestingly, 34% of our veteran population here are uninsured. So that places us in a perfect position as a community health center to be able to support those veterans. We do have some standardized screening tools that we use here for all of our patients, but it's of highlighted importance with our veterans. We screen for depression and we screen for substance use disorders, all of our patients. But um, as you know, there's a high rate of mental health issues as well as substance use issues among the veterans. So community health centers are perfectly positioned to support those veterans because um, here at Stedman Wade Health Services, as well as most community health centers have an integrated behavioral health program to support those. And we also have certified substance abuse counselors um, on staff. So we work closely together as a team to support the health care needs of those veterans, both their physical and their mental needs. Also, we have um, a prepare screening tool that we use to screen for social determinants of health. And that helps us to identify those veterans who may be needing some assistance with food, clothing, housing. Um, and we have a robust case management program to get them linked to resources in the community and specifically within the veteran system. Thank you, Shauna. And Rodney, turning to you, similarly, can you share some of the strategies you've used to successfully identify and connect with your veteran community? Hi, Meg. Uh, thank you, everybody, for this opportunity to talk about veterans. Um, that's something I'm just really passionate about, just like everybody on the panel. You know, it gets in your heart and your bones, and you'll just do whatever it takes to help the veteran community. So, interesting enough, I got a, a call from a buddy last week who served in Afghanistan. And just like everybody's aware, you know, not all veterans have benefits. You know, if they did a short six-year tour, 
they didn't retire out. They don't have a service related injury. They, they don't qualify. And he was talking to me about just a lot of the problems he's had with, with depression and PTSD and just kind of adjusting back to the real world. And so, you know, I just chatted with him about the benefits of getting into an FQHC and the sliding scale program and, and how that just directly relates to what his needs are. But that's everywhere, especially in rural areas where there's uh, limited access. Uh, some of the things that we did uh, when I was in the FQHC world, we were doing what FQHCs do best, and that's being really, really deeply involved in the communities. And when we did that, we'd always have our veteran um, care. We had a little brochure we handed out, and we would uh, make sure people knew that we could take care of veterans, even if they didn't qualify for you know veteran benefits. We could get them in. We'd take everybody. Um, another thing that we did that was very, very effective, and I know a lot of regions have limited capability, is partnering with their American legions. A lot of legions have veteran service officers that are basically they're volunteers that are trained in, in all the resources available. But we partnered with the American legions on a regular basis. One year, we had a 5K fun run, and we all the proceeds went to the American legion. And the commander even ran in, in the race, and uh, he, he gave a great presentation at the end of it about our community health center and just about what we bring to the rural community. Uh, veteran resource fairs, not sure if anybody's attended one of those. I know Rhonda has, and I've talked to her about it, but those are amazing to partner with your American Legion and other not-for-profits to, to collectively take care of the veteran population. Um, another thing we did is uh, we would give presentations on a regular basis on um, resources for veterans, and we would just go out and speak about it. Uh, I love going to the American Legions and talking about those resources that were available. But, you know, it, it's a difficult population to connect with for many reasons. And Oftentimes in the military, you know, you were told wrap duct tape around it uh, or take Motrin, just take a bunch of Motrin, you're gonna be fine. And just kind of stuff it, uh, you know, not discuss it. But I think the most effective way in connecting out there is just doing what we do best and having those relationships in the community and building that trust. Thanks. Well, good morning, good afternoon from the uh, Great Pacific Northwest. Uh, first, I want to say how honored I am to be part of this conversation with you all. Uh, I'm the daughter of a World War II Navy veteran and his war bride he brought home from northern Morocco back in 1945. Continuing the conversation on screening efforts, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the importance of mental health in our veteran community. Yakima is in central Washington state. Uh, our community, as Rodney just mentioned, just had our veterans stand down this last weekend. Uh, we've been doing this for about 20 years now, and that's a service fair for veterans if you're not familiar with it. It started as a service fair strictly for veterans who were experiencing homelessness, but now we've grown to a service fair for all veterans, and this year we added a career fair for the event. Yakima Neighborhood Health Services has been participating for most of those 20 years. What we've learned from this and other outreach efforts is our behavioral health team is most effective by meeting our veterans in their spaces. And it's often that it takes most more touches and more time than with our general populations when it comes to screening for behavioral health issues. We also use the prepare tool. We also, we also use the uh, PHQ-9, which is the depression screen and the PTSD screening tools. We incorporate them into conversations in our clinics, on the streets, out by the river, and also in our supportive housing units. What my coworkers say is through these conversations, when talking with their veterans, they anticipate guaranteed trauma, and they pay particular attention to evaluate for possibilities of hidden but common disabilities like brain injury and chronic pain. As a community health center, our teams focus on primary care behavioral health. We're fortunate to have a psychiatric nurse practitioner on staff 
who works closely with our behavioral health specialists and our primary care providers to address medication management in a holistic manner for our patients. And we also partner with our local community mental health agency for psychiatric uh, access and support. So Dr. Matthews, I'd like to ask, uh, looking at this topic from a wider lens, can you tell us a little bit about what the veterans health system is working on to continue prioritizing behavioral health screenings, care, and benefits in the veterans community? Thank you so much, Rhonda. Yes, I, I think um, everything that you've highlighted is, is so critical. And I, I think what we are really proud to promote is that we are constantly working on on ways to be innovative and that's what i'm i'm hearing there in in washington state as well too that we need to be innovative and we need to meet them where they are um i think we are proud to have a very broad spectrum of care that that spans from self-help apps and and kind of self-motivated work to outpatient care residential treatment uh and then of, of course acute and and hospitalization on an inpatient standpoint. Uh, we really range the gamut as far as access, as far as, of course, emergent and crisis access, um, need to get initial evaluations through our emergency departments and our urgent cares, same day visits, all of our facilities, every single one of them provides same day appointment availability for mental health. We ask veterans to walk in at any time so that we can meet their needs and even um, in the, the last year alone, we completed 13 million of those visits. So we are, we are very proud to continue to, to try to meet that need. Um, sometimes, though, there is some local variability, and, and we acknowledge that, and, and we know that there's room for improvement uh, as well as innovation as well as far as kind of wait time for, for more scheduled care. Um, sometimes, on average, up to an 11-day wait time, which we know we need to bring down. There are definitely some areas that are, are much shorter, but overall, actually, our mental health access is more rapid than even our primary care access. We, we really do uh, promote the mental health services in that regard for, for obvious reasons. And then, my goodness, we, we all, the whole country, right, has access issues with regard to uh, perhaps not being within travel distance, not necessarily uh, being able to connect. So the fact that we've been able to expand our video connect services um, quite rapidly, many of us have, right, during the pandemic. Um, but honestly, last fiscal year alone, 5.5 million telehealth visits for behavioral health alone. That is just behavioral health. We, we have plenty more going on. In fact, I like to brag, one of our facilities in Florida was even doing telehealth physical therapy. I mean, we got so innovative over the last year. Um, but, but those mental health visits, we are, we are proud to continue to expand in different ways, group visits as well. The biggest message, of course, is that this access is what going to actually uh, uh, meet the veterans where they are and meet their needs. And of course, our, our number one clinical concern prevent suicide. Uh, this in and of itself through our Office of Mental Health and Suicide Prevention, it continues to be our number one clinical priority and we will continue to hold that high and we will continue to work with you, our partners, uh, states, uh, governors, uh, tribal nations, uh, all partners willing to come to the table to really address uh, suicide in general. We, we approach this from a public health standpoint. It is not just a clinical concern, but that we must work together as a nation and educate and involve caregivers, involve family members, and the like uh, to be able to be there for that veteran in the time of a crisis, because we can't necessarily always be there. You can't necessarily always be there because it's it's in that room with them where they need to be making uh, the connection. So we've expanded our lethal means safety campaigns. I don't know any of you have, if you've seen our commercials over the past month through September was suicide prevention month and, and we've really been expanding, looking at that number one cause of suicide, unfortunately, which is lethal means and how can we make that safer? It's not about separating the veteran from their firearms, but how do we just increase the time and distance of that veteran from that firearm during that time of crisis? That's what we need. So it's, it's really about educating how families can assist and, and look at um, gun locks and the like, just to be able to help at that moment when we really need to, to be able to be by that veteran's side. 
We have additional community based interventions. I mentioned that we have governor's challenges, state challenges where we're really trying to work with local governments as well too. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll say it's not enough. I'll say it's not enough because we're not at zero yet. Uh, we are, we are truly aiming for zero veteran suicides. 2021, our data is, is improving, uh, but it's not where we need to be, but I'll share a couple of details in, in 2019, we actually had 399 fewer veterans die by suicide than in 2018. So we're actually uh, going in the right direction as compared actually to the broader population. So we actually consider this one of our anchors of hope that we are making a difference that our joint efforts are helping. Um, and that in general for female veterans in particular, uh, we saw a 13% decrease over the same year as well too. So we were happy with those numbers, um, but it doesn't mean that we sit back in and, and that we're finished and that we rest on this. So uh, we're, we're feeling more hopeful. We're continuing to expand our veterans crisis line. Uh, Dr. Lisa Kearney uh, is my director over that, that line and we're expanding that staff to pretty astronomical numbers uh, to be able to answer phones in, in unprecedented times. Um, please make sure, I, I thank uh, Ashley for putting this in the chat, but just to reiterate, I hope that everyone can acknowledge uh, and, and save in their phones, even our veteran crisis uh, line, which is 24 seven available to answer any concerns at any point. That number is 1-800-273-8255. Um, please make sure that we can help that veteran uh, during that time of crisis. And our crisis line is a trained force. We are here uh, to assist and, and we hope that even your providers, even if you need that assistance, perhaps while you're in the health center, while, if you want them to connect to a peer, to a specialist who can help them through that crisis moment, please even call them right from the exam room. We are here to help in, in whatever setting possible. So thanks for letting me run. <laughs> I, 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 I like bragging about this work that we've done, but also acknowledging again that, that we have plenty of work to continue to do. Um, but with that, uh, I'll, 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 I'll move on. We've got plenty of more questions and everything. And Rhonda, actually, I, I think it's my turn to turn it back to you. Um, we know and see that health centers are, are, not on, are not the only place where a veteran seeks out medical care, but also social services. We know for a fact that that's part of our larger mission, right, in health, ce health centers, social service resources around employment and food and, and housing. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the work that you're doing as far as building those local partnerships specific to veteran housing there? And, and what are your, your ongoing efforts looking like? Yes, well, like you, this is one of my favorite topics as well. Uh, one of our strongest partnerships here in Yakima is with the Yakima H Housing Authority. Just this fall, a few weeks ago, the Housing Authority opened 41 units of permanent supportive housing for homeless veterans. Uh, they were able to obtain the Marine Corps Armory in town and converted it to uh, it and the land around it to housing and a resource center. We opened a primary care site with medical, dental, and behavioral health services right in the middle of the arm, in, actually in the armory building. The site is named Chuck Austin Place. Staff Sergeant Austin served in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. And he died just earlier this year of COVID at the age of 95. I just was amazed that, uh, you know, someone served in all three wars and then COVID is what, what took his life. He was actually part of our groundbreaking ceremony in 2019, but unfortunately he did not live to see the veterans moving into those apartments this summer or using our healthcare services that opened up two weeks ago. I mentioned earlier the veteran stand down. Uh, this event happened this last Saturday and we had more than 100 service providers, many of which we partner with on a regular basis. Uh, reaching out to support our veteran community. We had community colleges, vocational programs, NAMI, the Asso National Association on Mental Illness, and also our county government, who we contract with to provide many uh, basic needs. Through these, year, through these partnerships, we've been able to offer many basic needs like food vouchers, rental assistance, and help applying for other benefits. As, as uh, one of my behavioral health specialists said, everybody wants to be warm. So often having items like blankets and coats available, these are the carrots that we help 
us, that help us engage our veterans into services. I, I'd also say that because of our outreach in the community, our partnerships take us where the veterans are. They help our organization and all of our sites, and we have 10 sites in the Valley, some of them rural. We're seen as a welcoming organization to the veterans, and that's certainly our goal. The veterans recognize us, and that helps us recognize them. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Matthews and Rhonda. Um, it's, you know, I also experienced as both a soldier and a spouse, the array of services that the military provides. So it really heartens me to hear the expanding role that health centers and community partners are playing and continuing to meet the needs of those who serve. So thank you. Shifting gears some, Rodney, we know there are numerous veterans working in health centers across the nation and understand you have progressed from serving in the Air Force as a combat medic uh, slash nurse to working in a health center and then working for Missouri PCA. How is, has your military training and experience prepared you to work in the health center environment and help you in combating COVID-19? Thanks, Meg, that's a great question. Well, ironically, I've told my wife many times, not only when I worked back in the FQHC, but more recently during the pandemic here in the PCA that I feel like I'm back in the military. Uh, I, other, other than not being deployed, uh, just the urgency of what's going on. But I told her the beautiful thing is I got to come home every evening to my wife and kids. So that's a great thing. So there's a lot of things that translate from the military directly to what we do in the community health center world. It's, it's unbelievable. Uh, one of the things is my training, of course, as a medic and several others on the call, your specific training in the military, uh, you can directly apply into the community health center world, but also training in like communication, logistics, advanced planning, collaboration, all of those have had, a, especially during the pandemic, they've played a very important role. Uh, humanitarian events, you know, back when I was in the military, you know, we responded to flood. You know, we, we had the mock drills for earthquakes and pandemic. So a lot of those things that we did in the military <laughs> doing in the community health center world already. Uh, specifically, also dealing with different nationalities. If, if you were fortunate enough to have a deployment to a third world country and uh, dealing with different cultures, many different languages, that is, that's a great experience. I remember when we were tasked to, to do a pop-up testing event right when the pandemic first hit, we had to test several thousand in five days. We had 16 different languages come through the testing site. So, you know, when veterans have that experience already to bring into the community health center world, um, that's a game changer. And that makes a big difference. Specifically for emergency management, you know, and FQs were, were challenged with that because oftentimes we're the first line of defense. Um, if you were blessed to be uh, a medic or a combat medic, that's what you were trained for, is to rapidly deploy and set up and be first responders in um, training an incident command, partnering with local, state, and federal agencies. All of that, you know, culminates to um, really benefit the community health center world. Last thing, if you were in the military, you were trained to sustain during a long-term deployment. This pandemic has been unbelievably long. You know, we're going on almost two years. And so luckily, uh, those of us in the military, you know, we had training to sustain that type of deployment. So thank you. Thank you, Rodney. Appreciate it. Yes, my husband and I have had eight deployments between the two of us, so I can definitely attest to that. Um, Shauna, you are also an Army medic, so I would love to hear if you could say a word or two about your career trajectory from a medic in the Army to health center clinician and then share some insights into how health centers can be more active in recruiting health 
care professionals after their military service. Yes, yes, that's right. So my my um, path to where I'm at now has been a very interesting one, but it's a story that I absolutely love to tell. So upon separation from the military, I started my college education and I was lucky enough to be selected for a pilot program at East Carolina University where they were doing some distance learning for physician assistants for the didactic portion. So that meant that I was able to continue to work while I did my schooling. That landed me quite by chance here at this community health center, a job at the front desk as a receptionist. So I did that for a year and a half. Now, when I accepted this position at the desk, I had no idea what a special, wonderful place I had landed, but it didn't take long. It didn't take long for me to realize there was something really amazing happening here, and I fell in love with the mission. So after a year and a half, I, I resigned my position to finish my schooling, stayed out for a year, and came back here as a physician assistant. And I've been here now for 18 years in that position. Wouldn't go anywhere else. I absolutely love my job. I love the community health center world and, and this is where I plan to retire. So um, that being said, I would like for other veterans not to land here so much by chance, but maybe more by guidance, um, because we know veterans just have so much to offer to, to any employer, but as, as uh, Rodney stated, community health centers are a very special place and veterans are just perfectly suited to meet those needs, particularly veterans from healthcare um, fields. So, uh, you know, I think it's important for us as community health centers to embed ourselves in the out processing of those service members as they get ready to leave their time in the service. I think we should be um, advertising wherever we can in the active duty community as those soldiers are getting ready to leave their time. I think we should be attending job fairs. I, I would like to see us continue to partner in programs that support the employment of uh, disabled veterans, partners like the Compensated Work Therapy Program. Um, you know, we could partner with, with the Veterans Administration and, and other organizations in helping those veterans. Um, you know, that being said, we have a, a large military base here and a large VA hospital here as well. And so, um, some of our biggest obstacles to recruiting veterans here, uh, particularly in the healthcare field, are, you know, as a community health center to recruit those veterans, we have to be able to match the salary and the benefits that are being offered um, in those federal positions at the VA hospital and other places. But, um, you know, aside from that, if, if we can get them in the door, they're a wonderful asset to us. Thank you, Shauna. And Dr. Matthews, the honor of the last question is yours. All right. This has been so wonderful. Thank you all for your for your service and, and your commitment. I think I'll, I'll turn back to Rodney. We know that the inclusion of the veterans voice in, in healthcare leadership and board membership and decision making is incredibly important. I mean, we as health centers prioritize the patient voice in general, but the veteran voice here, as you've all explained, is, is so critical. In your own experience as a veteran and as an executive leadership member of, of your state PCA there, what are some key aspects that veterans bring to the table when it comes to providing high quality and accessible care to our vulnerable populations? Thank you, Dr. Matthews. That's a, that's a great question. I could talk for an hour about that, but I'm gonna limit it because time is nigh. Uh, I got four main reasons why uh, the first Reason is perspective. Oftentimes, those in the military, um, if you served, if you made it through boot camp, if you've had to work with others for teamwork to get a goal done, if you've had a deployment, if you've been overseas, you've experienced different things, you bring a very unique, I want to say, maturity and perspective. We need that in our community health center world. We need a global understanding of what's going on. And I really think military members bring that, whether it's working in a clinic as an MA or an LPN, as a board member, or at the PCA or in leadership, I think perspective. Number two is results driven. 
all of you know veterans uh, who are focused. They have gazelle focus on getting things done. So I like that aspect about our veteran community, and we need more of that oftentimes in healthcare and in the FQH world. So results driven. Integrity. I'm sure everybody knows a veteran who exemplifies integrity. And those that have that, if they can be in a clinic setting with with workforce shortages like they are and all the other issues in the world, if we can bring in people like that who attract and retain good quality workers, I think that's stupendous. So integrity. Last one is mission. Mm -hmm. When we were in the military, we had a profound purpose in life. And then being able to get out and then get into the community health center world and kind of readjust, but focus on something more important, uh, on serving the underserved populations, I think is just profound. So that's all I'm going to say. I want to stop right there. Let the others take it from there. I'm I'm taking I'm feverish taking notes. Feverish. I'm, yeah. I'm going to turn to you, Shauna. What what, what more can what, 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 you? What more would you add? Sorry, sorry, Shauna. Sorry. No, no, no. Absolutely. You know, um, there must be a lot of truth to what you're saying because I have a lot of those same things in my notes. Veterans absolutely um, are are suited for leadership positions. Our training and our experience um, really position us perfectly for leadership positions. Um, and, and some of the important things that I had noted mirror exactly what you've said. Veterans bring discipline, integrity, and such a level of commitment. Um, I think that, you know, that's extremely important. I think that, you know, veterans, particularly those who have experienced combat, um, have learned how to work under stress and how to, to maintain when things get a little bit crazy. Um, and, but I think really, one of the most important things about hiring a veteran um, is that veterans really have an appreciation for the sanctity of life. Veterans really realize the importance of doing what's necessary to make sure that people have a healthy and a meaningful life. Um, you know, if you've ever been deployed, as many of us have, you, you learn to have a great appreciation for life and for all of the many things that we have to be grateful for. So, um, you know, in a community health center setting that really translates as we work with such diverse populations. And so, um, you know, getting back to the question of leadership, I think that once we um, get some veterans in on in and on board, it doesn't take long for them advance to leadership positions. Um, because they're just perfectly suited for that. But I also think, too, we would be remiss not to mention, you know, let's hire some of those veterans for the leadership positions right out the gate because these veterans who have spent 20 or more years have a lot of great experience, a lot of leadership experience, and, and can really bring some wonderful things to positions on our our boards, um, our membership teams, our leadership teams. So, yes, a lot to offer. Thank you so much, Shauna. And Rhonda, I'd love to hear your perspective as well, too. Well, I'm laughing because I think this is the one question that my colleagues and I might have wanted to prepare together for because I'm just crossing things off as each one of them have said these. So the only uh, the only uh, attribute that I would add um, that they haven't said is uh, team oriented. And I think maybe they've alluded to this in different ways. Um, I crossed off mission driven. I crossed off focused, um, but I didn't haven't yet crossed off team oriented. And I think that when I uh, think about um, the members on our leadership team and, and even our, my coworkers that are not yet part of the leadership team, the, the attribute that I think about them most is that they're team centered and team oriented. They're very invested in uh, helping everyone on the team succeed, and that includes the patients. Love it. Thank you all so much. I, I think that sums it up perfectly. Uh, I thank you all for the opportunity for letting me participate today alongside with you. I'll hand it back to you, Meg. Thank you. It's been an honor and a pleasure to have all of you here today, Dr. Matthews, Rhonda, Shauna, and Rodney. As we look to next month and celebrate Veterans Day, 
I could not think of a more um, important and timely discussion as veteran and, and health center advocate myself. I'm truly grateful for all of the incredible work uh, you continue to do to assure our military service members and their families are provided the highest quality care that they deserve. So for decades, uh, CEDRUS have been a key health and social service provider to our veterans community. As, speaker, as our speakers confirmed today, the legacy, spirit, and health of America's uh, military are vital to our nation's overall safety and well-being, and we honor their sacrifice and service. So as you know, NAC is celebrating our 50th anniversary this year, and these monthly fireside chats offer an opportunity to highlight the impact community health centers have and are making every day across America, especially in this time when we're still fighting COVID-19. NAC is honored to represent the voices of nearly 30 million patients, 14,000 nonprofit community health center sites, over 250,000 staff, and 12,000 community and consumer board members. You can visit our website and click on the 50th anniversary section and, the, and on the scrolling homepage to hear all of the past webinars. Thank you all for attending today and please join us next month on Tuesday, November 30th at 2 p.m. Eastern, where we'll be hearing a discussion about the health center workforce. With that, I wish you all a great rest of your day and thanks again for attending.